Welcome to the Floor Academy podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Hadeen, former installation contract and contractor and boutique store owner. I'll get it out there. I'll, I'll get it right, guys. One of these days, one of these will go flawlessly and I, and I won't stutter or fumble through it or anything like that. Uh, thank you for joining us. This week, we have Pandy Pridemort joining us. She is the principal consultant and mediator for the Human Resource USA. Thank you to Josh Hansman for setting this up. And what we're going to be looking at is who's going to come after you? Uh, P- Pandy and I got to talking after after Josh introduced us, and um, she brought up a really good point of, you know, you we constantly worry about the tax man. Usually that's a pretty easy avoidance. Most of us play within that that morally gray area and have a professional helping us out to to guide us along and keep us protected in that aspect. And, you know, you don't usually worry about yourself. You don't worry about your employees too much. And then she was like, well, what about their spouse? What about the client that gets upset? And she was like, there's a ton of agencies out there. And it got me thinking, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, the Labor Department could come after you. The Environmental Protection Agency could potentially come after you for doing some contracting stuff. I know in Arizona, like dust is a really big thing, especially because we have um, there's there's spores that grow that can give you what's called valley fever, which is really bad if you get it. And so if you're not watering all of the dirt as you're kicking up dust and stuff to reduce as much as possible, then you can get people sick and in really big trouble. So there's lots of other agencies out there that can come after you instead of just being worried about the tax man. And I think that's the biggest one we're usually worried about. So Pandy is going to guide us through and help us figure out who we need to be looking out for, how we can protect ourselves, and really just help us understand why human resources is more than just harassment cases. It's it's not about just having someone there so they can guide you through the sexual harassment complaints that come in because the guys are acting like dogs on the job site again. It's it's human resources is so much more than that. And so we'll dig into a little bit of that and then we'll get into the you know, topic of who do we really need to be looking out for and how do we protect ourselves. And so that's why you want to be listening to the Floor Academy podcast every week. We are diving into the topics to help you go from owning a job to owning a business so that you can free up your time, get a lifestyle lift, be more efficient and do the things you want to actually do with the income from your business, like spend time with your family, go on vacation instead of slaving away seven days a week, hours and hours a day keeping it all together. It's not easy being a small business owner, and we're here to help you get that being an easier task. Before I have Pandy introduce herself, we got a quick little ad from Cronus. If you're struggling to keep your schedule, forgetting to follow up with clients, or your books are behind, Cronus Flooring Business Manager has the solutions you are looking for. Streamline your life, gain more freedom, and maintain control of your business. From scheduling to follow-up reminders, integration with QuickBooks, and producing quotes quickly, you can say goodbye to your business headaches. Visit chronosoft.com slash academy today to schedule your demo for this one, this all-in-one approach for flooring business organization. That's K-R-O-N-U-S-S-O-F-T dot com slash academy. Cronus, fast relief for your flooring business headaches. You can click on the link in the show notes, get scheduled up, and uh, they will take great care of you over there. I'm sure Chesney would love to give you a demo or or Victor would love to give you a demo. Pandy, thank you so much for joining me. Who are you? What do you do? And why do you do it? Yeah, who am I? Uh, I consider myself an old shoe in HR. I've been doing this for over 40 years, 44 to be exact. Uh, located up here in Cincinnati, I am what do you consider an expert in compliance and regulatory. So my entire focus is helping businesses understand the federal as well as the state laws across mm-hmm. the country to employ individuals. And here three years ago, I went back to school. And so now I am a mediator and can mediate employment issues um, with attorneys. But the, the real focus is me on a daily basis, partnering with, well, gosh, any size business, Mm -hmm. because that's, that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions. Kyle, is that most companies think they're too small to get into trouble. And that is by far not the case. For sure. 
it can it can happen very quickly with with yourself one employee 10 employees uh and i don't know that a lot of people realize i i guess fr be having a fractional cfo is becoming a thing if, if you're kind of growing hiring someone to be like a part-time chief financial officer is a thing but essentially you're offering fractional hr services and that that is that's a thing that's out there in the world well and you know what's really nice is the technology has made things like processing payroll even enrolling in employee benefits maintaining or monitoring cobra payments uh even fmla uh timing and and record keeping that has all become so easy that it's almost paperless mm -hmm. but what hasn't gotten easier is dealing with those day-to-day -day people issues and what can i say what can't i say what can i put in writing and what can't i put in writing and very truthfully i've got a presentation right now that's going to be on uh, july 11th talking about all the changes that have occurred just since the beginning of this year and and with major organizations and uh, agencies government agencies that mm -hmm. we can't get we're not going to escape from this stuff i don't care who you are you're not going to escape it oh, i believe it i look if, if they want you they're going to get you there's there's that's no ifs ands or buts around it it doesn't matter your size i mean what do you have to do now they I think they delayed it, but it was even for your taxes now as, as a small business owner, like you have to sign off on something saying the income is from a certain like I, there was something with a certain amount of money when it's exchanged, you have to sign off on it now or something. And it got I don't even remember, but there was something. That, and I think they pushed it another year because they weren't able to implement it in time, which no surprise for the government. But that's a whole nother story. Okay. Yeah. It's, and and plaus plausible deniability doesn't work. You mm -hmm. can't look at a government agency and say, oh, I didn't I didn't know that that they are not going to take any excuses. In fact, when I, you know, and Jason and 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 we all started talking about some of this stuff, um, one of the first conversations that we had was how the difference between a 1099 versus a W-2 mm -hmm. employee affected this particular industry. I have a, a client that does flooring. And we had to go literally through every one of their subcontractors and redefine how that relationship worked with them. And very truthfully, they had to make some major changes, I believe it. including making some of them W-2 employees because of the criteria involved. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's 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 not just a flooring industry problem. It's a construction industry problem. But people love to be like, oh, I got a 1099 employee. No, you can either have an employee or you can have someone that's an independent contractor and they're two very, very different things and they're handled very, very differently. And so you can't have the best of both worlds and, and have, you can't call all the shots and then not match their taxes and provide workman's comp and benefits and all, all these other things. Like it, it doesn't work that way. It's one or the other. Uh, but there's, I have episodes on that, folks. You can go back and there, there's a couple of episodes. So we're not going to dig down that hole. But yes, it's it's amazing how many have it wrong and, and think they have it right. And it just requires sitting down with someone that really, really knows and, and they would clear it all up. I mean, I was doing, uh, I was having a conversation the other day and the guy was like, oh, we got tools that all their guys can borrow. And I was like, I don't know, that's getting kind of iffy. Like you're now providing tools to subcontract and I wasn't going to get into it, but like just providing the tools to subcontractors to borrow. And I was like, if you rented them, even for a dollar, you know, just <laughs> in, in my head, I'm like, that alleviates a lot of problems right here. Well, uh, you know, I just, I look at my clients and go, excuse me, but uh, that looks like it has a bill and web feet and feathers. So if it looks like a duck and acts like a duck, it is a duck, mm -hmm. hands down. And you know the the other thing that I hope you included in your episode was that wage and hour will go back three years. They'll interview terminated individuals, whether they're 1099s or W twos. Mm -hmm. They will interview those individuals and ask them how they were treated and how they were paid, and if they were um, kept in a compliant manner within the relationship with the business. So it, it, it's not just the people that you have with you now. Mm -hmm. They will go back and dig up the dirt. Well, that was what, that was what kind of brought this up when we were initially setting all this up. And I, I that was fascinating. It's not usually 
your employee that's going to do it. And and I got to thinking and it was, you were like, well, it's going to be the spouse or something like that. And, and you're 100% correct because I started thinking about the conversations is I myself would come home and I'd be complaining about the boss and talking about how I want to go out on my own. And my wife's like, yeah, yeah, you should do that. You can do it. Like, screw that guy, right? I was yeah. like, oh, that's how these things happen, right? The guy starts coming home. He's complaining. The the significant others are like backing them up and building them up and telling them that they should go do all these things. And it could be the significant other that goes and files the complaint with the labor board saying, hey, I think my my you know, partner is being paid incorrectly. You should go look at this company. And then that, that owner gets hit with, you know, three years of back taxes, not paid on this person, plus every other employee. And you can quickly go out of business. And and I think that's one reason why some much larger companies will do spousal interviews and they'll want to oh, sit God. down with, with the couple <laughs> and, and meet them and, and get them on board. But I, you know, it's, it's one thing that I've realized, like really smart companies are out there trying to provide the benefits and get the, if you keep the spouse happy, the guy's going to come home and complain. And then the spouse is going to say, don't screw this up. We have benefits. Finally, we're making good yes. money. Like if you get the spouse on your side, you can alleviate a lot of these concerns, but it's going to take doing things in a manner of which you cover your butt, which is exactly what we're going to dig into. So Who's out there beside, you know, again, I think we're generally worried about it. It's the tax man. The tax man's going to get us. There's so many more. Where do we I'll even tell you start? What the, the one that, you, that I love to talk about is the National Labor Relations Board, one of the most misunderstood agencies. And here's the catch with this is that you don't have to be unionized for this organization to be able to influence and affect what you're doing. The most recent major change within this organization was redefining and um, reestablishing the term insubordination. And what I mean by that is you are, it is now impossible for, well, let me back up. The National Labor Relations Board has okay. uh, with, within the National Labor Relations Act, section seven and eight prohibits employers from restricting conversation about compensation, work conditions, and terms of employment. So catch what I said. Your employees are allowed to go out and talk about their compensation. Mm -hmm. You cannot tell them they can't. I don't care if you have it in your handbook, that's illegal. They can go out and talk about, um, well, I got hired for $15 and I know, you know, you, did you get hired for 15? And the guy says, no, I got hired for 13, oops. Mm -hmm. They're allowed to talk about that. They're allowed to talk about safety issues, which is work conditions. Do you have too many potholes in your parking lot? Do you, uh, are you asking them to work with uh, equipment that needs to be repaired or in unsafe conditions? They're allowed to talk about that. And when they're allowed to talk about it in the workplace, they're allowed to talk about it on social media. You cannot stop that. So by redefining the definition of insubordination, Kyle, this means that if somebody decides to just walk off a job, you can't terminate him until you identify if that had anything to do with one of those three categories. Interesting. So the whole term of job abandonment, which I'm finding in handbooks every day, mm -hmm. um, it absolutely is not permitted anymore unless you've proven that the individual was not protected by the National Labor Relations Board and that they did it for a reason otherwise. And that's very hard for a lot of companies to grasp. Um, very triple, I was looking up cases the other day where individuals are allowed to just cuss out, I mean, nasty stuff uh, to a business owner or to a supervisor. And because it was in relationship or in regards to one of those three categories, they're protected. You can't terminate them for that. And that is so against the grain of the way we've always done things. It's it's mm -hmm. it's coming with a tremendous amount of resistance. Yeah, it sounds like it's it's loud. It's good for employees, <laughs> well, but it's this. bad for employers because there's probably a fine line between what's actually happening and, and what needs to happen and 
all, all I know is that when I, when I was with the, the big brown package delivery company and we had to deal with union employees, I was taught one thing, document, document, document. And that is if you want to actually be able to fire someone and not lose your butt in court or with some state agency, you better have the documentation to back it up. And, and that I think that's what's going to save you in this case is we talked oh. about this. We talked about this. We address this. We like and at that point, if it's I guess if it's legitimately a problem because there's safety concerns or something like, OK, that's justifiable. But is it safety concerns because they didn't follow the training that you consistently provided and they weren't listening. Right. And so now the documentation could save you there. Well, you also have the oversensitivity of some employees who, who just decide, you know, I'm, I'm offended because, or I'm upset because, yeah. and there's, again, you've got that huge fine line where you really have to dig in. And the legal term is called interactive process. If you can engage with them, get a conversation going on to find out what the core issue of their discontent is, then you can you can more, you know, proper more properly address it. But if if they're upset because they didn't get a, a 3% increase and they only got a, a 2% increase, so they go and cuss out their supervisor, they're protected and they're allowed to do that. You mm -hmm. the sooner you can pull them back and say, okay, here's what you have to do to get the other percent. That's that's the answer. But most companies are moving at the speed of light. They don't have or want to take the time to walk these people through and help them, you know, calm down their emotions. But there's too many emotions in the workplace anyway. So, yes, it's 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 difficult for companies to grasp that that a lot of the things that are changing in human resources are definitely not in line with the employer. They are much more on the side of the employee. Has it been that off balance the in, like in the favor of the employer for a long time though? Cause that, that's how I, no. I know. No, the Trump, the Trump administration was very employer friendly. The Biden administration has been very vocal and very open about their pro-union stands. Mm -hmm. And many of the initiatives that have come out of this administration are very uh, reflective of the Obama you know, administration and have, well, they've taken, let's go back, they've taken severance agreements and diced them out. So the gag, what I always call the gag order in a severance agreement has been removed. So individuals traditionally knew if they got a severance agreement, they weren't to discuss it with anyone. No one mm -hmm. knew how much that severance agreement was for. No one knew why the individual was getting uh, a severance. And now you're able to talk about it. The National Labor Relations Board says, no, that's fair game, especially if it has anything to do with discrimination or harassment. Well, that's difficult because not all severance agreements are administered equally. You know, mm -hmm. some people have only been with the company six months. Others have been there for six years. You want to pay that out differently. But that can cause individuals to get disgruntled. Yes. They're also looking at removing the, they're talking, and uh, the general counsel for the NLRB has written a paper saying that she wants to allow individuals to work openly for multiple companies. And many of us look at that and say, well, wait a minute, I don't want you working for my competitor or I don't want you to work you know when I need you and you need to dedicate your time your time for, to me mm -hmm. and she wants it to be just the opposite well that's going to wreak havoc with all sorts of companies but yeah as I, I, yeah I, I think it's definitely one of those things where uh, you know like I don't want to get political they're, they're reporting plenty of jobs created but really it's just people taking on additional jobs um how do you how do you sell your time, especially if you if you're within you operate within the same space and then you have a, a conflict of interest between these companies that are technically competitors. And so I, I get that and it would be wise to not do that to yourself. But if that's your skill set, it's it's easy to operate within that field. And and I, I know people like I, I worked for a guy that had um he had two like IT jobs, but he was doing them at the same time. 
And I was like, that's unbelievable, man. You're like doubling up. And because it, it didn't actually, you know, he just had to like babysit screens and make sure things were running and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so he got hired by two different companies and he was working the same eight hour shift and he made sure to schedule the meeting so they didn't overlap and whatnot. I was like, this is crazy. And like that I see as a problem. Um, and even if it was like at different times, and he was doing 16 hours a day, that could be an issue because if you're working for a competitor and now you start having conversations with one about some sales related thing and then lo and behold, that same company is now talking to the competitor about it. You have insider knowledge that you probably shouldn't have to help one side or the other. Um, yeah, that's bad. That's that's not cool. So is it. Does this constantly evolve just back and forth as administrations change and we lean one way or the other politically and it's let's be more employee friendly, let's be more employer friendly and it just it's an ever shifting world. Well, and that's that's what business owners struggle with is that HR is a moving target. And when I'm talking about HR, for me, I'm talking about the compliance and regulatory side. Mm -hmm. um, recruiting is not necessarily HR. Employee benefits is not necessarily HR. But the legality of trying to employ people, the, the rules are just changing. Well, the Federal Trade Commission now is coming in and voicing their and, and, and having an influence on employment decisions. And their most recent decision was to eliminate non-competes. Mm -hmm. Now, that's going to be devastating for some organizations. I mean, devastating to think that those, even their terminated employees that may still be under a non-compete can now go out and, to your point, take trade secrets if they weren't specifically identified in any other documentation. Um, they can, you know, do some damage. Mm -hmm. Non-solicitations. Uh, NDAs, um, proprietary, some of those documents are, they're all still safe, mm -hmm. but a number of states here in the country are removing non-solicitation agreements. They're they had already removed non-competes. So this was a movement that the FTA, FTC looked at and said, oh, well, the states want this anyway, so we're just going to come in and, and push it along. And there's a number of appeals trying to slow this down. It's supposed to go into full effect in September. We're looking to see a number of courts across the country draw okay. some lines and say, you know, we're going to slow this down in, in August. Yeah, it's one of a lot of this stuff is they try and make it one size fits all. And it, it's not a one size fits all kind of thing. There is a lot of wiggle room within this space of how do we have to navigate it? And I think that's what makes this world so difficult as you're talking about it being a moving target and ever changing and who yeah. would think that the federal trade commission is going to step in and affect a small contracting business when i when i've developed a proprietary method that my employees know and they have to sign a non-compete agreement because they can't just run off and quit here and run down to sam's flooring and and start saying hey we were doing it like this over there and it was super successful we should take a look at this and consider it that well, and, and many thought it was unconstitutional for the FTC to step over. Uh, and they're leaning on the antitrust aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I Again, there's so many appeals. This is this is one that I definitely think will be challenged and uh, will be a bit of a struggle to get passed through yeah. um, even more than what the EEOC has just been doing. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's a waiting game. We just wait to see what's going to blow up tomorrow. So one one thing I know is when I was hiring people, um, we had to do well, you, you got to get the W-2 filled out. You got to do the background paperwork, the the I-9, I would the. Right, an I-9. Well, uh, like, first I'm going to back, back you up and say have them fill out a W-4. W-4, yes. You get a W-2, you fill out a W-4, but then you got to fill out the and, and I had to go and like register with the people to do the back. I don't even remember. Right. They just sent me an email and I was like, I don't have that anymore. Like unsubscribe. But it, it's like little things that I know that a lot of companies probably aren't necessarily doing. They're just like, oh, I'm going to hire the guy and throw him on payroll. Give me your info. Well, yeah. And you know, what's crazy is there's the I-9 is overseen by Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. So 
they have jurisdiction over that and that's for employment eligibility yes the, the irs is going to oversee the w-4 the state's going to oversee the state tax exemption which here in ohio is it4 in kentucky k4 um you've got the irs is also going to be watching to see where the money's going so any kind of direct deposit information or or documentation you need they have jurisdiction they can oversee that mm. the department of labor is going to oversee your employment application and any other documentation that you have say that you're just asking for emergency responses or um contact information in any if you're asking for any medical information regarding their allergies or anything like that the department of labor whether it's eeoc or wage now they're going to have jurisdiction over all of that so if you get caught on an audit for any of those things they're going to bring in the other organizations possibly to come in and look at what they're allowed to look at so it's yeah it's it's a little bit more complicated and again it doesn't mm -hmm. matter whether you have one employee or whether yeah. you have 20 employees well, uh, we might talk about that too if you have 15 or more employees, you're mandated by the Americans with Disabilities Act. You can't oh. escape that. You have to offer those protections to your employees. If you have more than 15 employees, you must offer the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which is a brand new, by the way, the pregnant worker is the most protected person in the workplace right now. You don't mess with a pregnant worker at all i believe it oh my god that I, so that actually brings up a really good uh question here is i was i was working with a company and and they had someone that became pregnant and then sadly she had a miscarriage but they were looking at they'd never had to deal with the fmla the family medical leave act and and how mm -hmm. is that going to start affecting them and what has to happen and i was like well do you even have a position available for her that she qualifies for because like how does that work? And if you hire someone for a specific task, but the company's not big enough to even offer them another position for them to continue in that isn't dangerous for them to be in while pregnant, are you legally yeah. allowed to like give them leave and then they can come back if they choose? Like, what do you, how do you even navigate that? Well, and there's there's so many different angles to come in at. FMLA doesn't start till you have 50 employees, five okay. zero. Got it. 50 employees within a 75 mile radius. So there's a good chance that company may not have been mandated by it, but okay. she may have qualified under ADA if they had over 15 employees. If she was pregnant today, she would have definitely been protected under the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act and. That particular language works on the limitations caused by pregnancy, not disabilities, limitations. Mm -hmm. And we look at the 40 week time period of, you know, up to childbirth where ADA never goes away. If you have a disability and disabilities include everything from migraines, um, allergies, mm -hmm. IBS, it's not that you have to lose an arm anymore. It's the yeah. quality of life. If, that individual needs an accommodation that never goes away and you seriously have to i mean you really have to prove whether you uh have to claim undue hardship that that comes down almost to a quantitative basis where you have to prove that it's costing your company way too much money to offer an accommodation now if she needed leave she could have possibly and they're always unpaid for the federal programs right now they're all unpaid leaves mm -hmm. But, she, you know, I would have even asked the company if possibly she had short term disability available to her. And we could have allowed that organization to determine whether she could take leave with pay. Now, there are a number of states across the country that are offering paid leave for a variety of reasons. And New York, for one, is offering it for miscarriages or the loss of a child. Mm -hmm. So you have to be really careful about your state laws before you turn somebody down. Mm -hmm. And that's any size. Most of those organizations or most of the states are, you know, asking companies of any size to provide leave. And um, so you really have to look into what state you're in before you answer that question. If I mean, 
if my company's not big enough to have them move into like a desk, she was a tile setter. So she's okay. out in the field setting tile, right? At some okay. point, the pregnancy is probably going to interfere with being able to do that effectively. Okay. But the company's not big enough to have her go and do an office job. Okay. And so what do you, like, how do you, what do you do? Because you can't just straight up, uh, you're, sorry, you're, like, you're fired. I'm sure there's something protecting her and saying you have to pay her. But now I'm going to pay someone to sit there and, and do nothing? Like, I didn't well, ask her to get pregnant. That was her choice. <laughs> yeah, but the key is what the medical provider would ask for. Because the medical provider tells us what that accommodation should look like. We're not medical. Most mm -hmm. of us are not medically trained so we can't say when she and she cannot self-diagnose herself correct now with fm well with with fmla and ada we have medical certification paperwork that we can hand to them under the pregnant workers fairness act we don't have to necessarily ask for medical certification if it's something simple like she needs more water or she needs to sit down during the afternoon she can't carry more than 50 pounds that's the kind of common sense that we all should be exercising at times. But if mm -hmm. she's flat out saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out, I, I can't do anything, then remember if, uh, PWFA, Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, is not paid leave either. So if, they, if her doctor says, look, she can't do any of the essential mm -hmm. work functions that you have available, she, you know, she's gonna have to be bedridden or such, there isn't any paid leave anyway. She can use her PTO vacation. Again, if short-term disability is available, you offer that. But you just make sure that the job is there when she comes back, even if you have to hire a temp mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to fill in during that time period. You don't terminate her at yeah. all. Yeah, yeah. No, I know that. I, I know you can't terminate her. She'd have to voluntarily quit. But, yeah. okay. So it, it's... There's there's going to be sticky situations, but this is exactly why being able to hire a company such as yourself with, with a, a fractional service is this is probably a couple hour phone call over a, a course of a few discussions and paying that fee is going to be way better than trying to navigate these murky waters on your own because this is not I, I know flooring. I know other contractors that know tile or carpet or like that. That's what we know. I don't want to. I mean, it's not that I don't want to know. I don't want to be the you expert in HR. I, I well, no, I, I, I want to be informed enough to know that I can get myself in a lot of trouble and I need to go hire the expert. But I need to know enough to hold the expert accountable. I, I think that's. That's where I like to be. I know enough to get myself in trouble that if I don't go get the expert and be able to hold them accountable, I know I'm going to end up in a, in a world of hurt. But if I don't know anything, then how do I know that you're doing a good job and telling me actual yeah. stuff that matters? So there's like a, there's a balance there, but it, this is why we need, it. you can't run a small business by the, by the seat of your pants. It, it can't constantly be on fire and on the edge. And, and that's where we like to be. It's fun and thrilling and exciting. But there's too many things that need to be kept track of for us to not have it nailed down. I kind of want to talk about what can go into an employee file and, and what can't and where it needs to be stored and how and, and how long. But I need to interrupt this real quick for a, a quick ad read here. The rumors are true. GoBoard Pro is available and approved for steam showers. GoBoard Pro was developed with the pro contractors ease of project workflow in mind. Panels sized at 48 by 64 inches will limit waste on your project, they'll require less seams, meaning less sealant is needed, and best of all, you can space those beautiful blue GoBoard fasteners out to 12 inches without the need for washers. Visit www.jm.com slash GoBoard for all of the product details and to learn about their other products. Schluter Systems is all about providing products and systems that ensure durable, functional, and beautiful tile installations. With an emphasis on education through their nationwide workshop program, for professionals, the goal of the company is to offer innovative solutions to tile industries that to the tile industry that solve common challenges faced by installers. 
Their product line includes over 6,000 items, including tile trims, uncoupling membranes, membranes, floor heating systems, waterproof building panels, shower systems, and thin set mortars. For more information or to register for a workshop, visit schluter.com. That's S C H L U T E R.com. Both of those links are in the show notes, folks. Go check them out. Both companies are absolutely excellent and will help you get your tile installations completed. Pandy. All right. We, we've we've kind of we're, we're on topic. We're not off topic, but we did hit on start talking about employees a little bit. And, you know, you can you can have this and that. So, like, what actually does need to go into an employee's file? Where do I store it? How do I store it? How long do I have to store it for? Because now people are giving me their social security stuff. I might be getting medical information, which is getting into HIPAA stuff. Like, I don't even know about half this stuff. <laughs> Well, I'm going to complicate it even worse because there's actually <laughs> five different files, five different files that you can have on every employee. Okay. So let's start with the first one. You, you're going to take basic information on the employee. So that's your personnel file. That's going to contain their banking information, their, their application, uh, any employment record with emergency contacts. You're going to put performance evaluations eventually in there. Maybe um, the references that you took on them. That's just personal stuff okay. in the personnel file. Then we're going to take a file and put it separate with the I-9s. Because remember, we talked, the Department of Labor can mm -hmm. come and see these things, but Homeland Security has jurisdiction over the I-9. If you get a subpoena for the personnel file, they're not sending you a subpoena for the I-9. So that's your second file. That could be a binder. Well, most, okay. most of my clients are just binders. Uh, the third one is going to be anything medically oriented. The EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, oversees any possible claim of discrimination based on, obviously, disabilities. So if someone has a medical form, and they should be giving you a medical form if they're coming back from a doctor or from a treatment or office surgery. All that documentation should be kept in a separate medical file. And if you're still taking paper benefit, um, employee benefit forms for insurance, um, dental, vision, mm -hmm. that should all be in that medical file. Because if you have somebody looking into the personal items of, of what was the last performance evaluation, like, you don't want them seeing a doctor's form in there saying that they were seen for their back. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden developing that bias. Oh, okay. I can't, he's got a bad back. It doesn't say he has a bad back. It just says he was seen for his back. So they're not going to promote him or move him or, you know, consider him for anything based okay. on that, that assumption. Fourth file is going to be your workers comp file. file. If, if you have a claim on somebody, with workers comp that needs to be kept completely separate personal files can be kept for the length of the employment and maybe four years afterwards payroll all payroll records are kept for four years afterwards so that's going to be separate but your workers comp information if it involves hazardous materials that could that could be required for up to 30 years maintaining that okay. paperwork so you want to work with your workers' comp organizations, whether it's state-funded or whether you're working through your general liability uh, company mm -hmm. to cover your workers' comp. Work with them to determine what goes into that file and then how long it should be retained. The last file is easy. It's training. It has nothing confidential in it. It's basically just certifications, confirmations that individuals have been trained. And a lot of my clients have individuals who want proof that the individual working on their job actually is, mm -hmm. has the expertise and the knowledge to do so. So those files I put out in the middle somewhere where anybody can get to them, they can add their certifications or their confirmations in as they go. Mm -hmm. But the rest of all those, those previous four files are gonna be locked and loaded somewhere secure with limited access. Okay, so I need a filing cabinet at a minimum that locks. Yep. And 
it's four separate file cabinets. None of those overlap. The, the four folders you described up in the, the first four folders you described all have to be stored individually. They cannot overlap. They cannot contain information from another folder. They, they are all separate. And I suggest color coding. Color codes so that you know if workers' comp is green and it's sitting on the top of a desk or out on a counter, that's got information on it that nobody else should see. So get it back into the filing cabinet. Mm -hmm. But I, I highly recommend color coding all the personnel, anything having to do with employment. That makes sense. And this is, again, this. Uh, who knew? I didn't know. I, I don't have half of that stuff. Uh, and I have some stuff from when I had employees. And it's probably like another two years before I can get rid of it. But I, okay. It's it can't of, all be together. That's, that's you know, yeah. for me, everything is, everything went in one folder that, you know, here's the invoices. Like it's, if the tax man comes, I'm just going to grab here. I got all the information, right? All the business stuff is for the, for that year is in one giant folder. And that can't necessarily be the yeah. case. Well, let's go back to the 1099s. If you, if you, if, if you actually have a bona fide 1099, mm -hmm. those, you, everyone should have a W9 on that individual. And those individuals should be invoicing. Yeah. Do not have them turning in timesheets. So, and, and please, I see it all the time. Individuals will, or businesses will give those 1099s work rules and, and pull right out of the employee handbook. Don't do that. It, again, if you're giving them something that says employee, the perception will be, oh, okay, I'm treated like an employee. Um, yes. Make sure that their information is completely separate and don't process their checks through your payroll system. A lot of payroll systems, the big ones especially, will have a section and say, yeah, put your 1099s in here. We'll cut 1099 checks. Don't, don't do it. I've seen wage an hour look at that and go, oh, well, you're treating them like an employee. So be very careful about how that works. Okay. Good to know. Cut, cut separate checks from the checking account for, oh, yes. uh, for, for 1099 guys that are independent contractors and then yes. have payroll process, payroll checks. Good advice. You should have a file on those 1099s with a copy mm -hmm. of their their um, general liability insurance or workers' comp. Yeah. And their their other information, just have it separate. Treat them like treat them like a, a vendor. Okay, so now we need we need we need six filing cabinets now because we're gonna have the 1099s in their own filing cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> or at least e you don't each need a separate filing. E not necessarily. Separate. Well, it depends on if I buy the single or if I buy, maybe I buy one that has three or four drawers in it and each individual there drawer can go. lock on its own. And so now I have drawers, but it, you know, I got one filing cabinet with four drawers. So now I need, I, I need six drawers that lock individually. <laughs> That's where we're at here, Pandy. <laughs> <laughs> and one person with the key. Don't, don't give too many keys out. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, especially as a, as a small business, that would definitely be a thing is somebody's got to be in, in control of it and around. And so hopefully you've got a trusted individual that knows not to go peeking around all the other files. Yeah. And that, and that and, and normally that's not a problem because the person who does have the key doesn't want anybody else to have the key. And mm -hmm. they are the controller of the of the domain. So and I never... I, well, so when you said that the folder should be a different color, I'm assuming that person is going and saying, okay, here, here's this. And if you're not getting it back within a reasonable time frame, I mean, how long can they really need it for? 10, 15 minutes at the most before it goes laying on the desk and gets lost and mixed up and stuff. And three weeks later, I don't like, even, what's that doing there? Yeah, don't even allow them to leave the office if you can control it. Just say, here's the file, look at it here mm -hmm. and take off. You don't need to make copies. Did they have a good review or not? Okay. Well, I'm just, if they have to type something up and send it off somewhere, like I, whatever they need, they couldn't need it for that long. Like you should pretty much be able to hand it over. They get the information they need and it immediately gets locked back up since it's private information and shouldn't be shared. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you also made a, an interesting comment earlier about HIPAA. One mm -hmm. of the biggest misconceptions about HIPAA is that HIPAA is anything involving medical when actually HIPAA only that that only comes into effect when we are speaking with the medical provider okay so the best advice for businesses is 
make sure that if the if the employee is bringing you information from their medical provider, it's coming directly from the employee. Don't have them fax it to you from the doctor's office. That's okay. where HIPAA steps in when we're actually talking or working with the medical provider. So uh, keep that buffer in there with the employment uh, employee making the decisions and uh, communicating. But even with them giving me medical information, am I not required to like not allow every... I, I'm required to not let everyone else in the office know whatever their condition is and stuff like there's still got to be some amount of protection for that person is there not? every bit every bit every bit in fact that's it's interesting one of the uh new guidance from the eeoc in just in defining a work uh, hostile work environment is that we're not even permitted as employers we're not permitted to talk to the rest of the company about an individual's gender identity they have to figure that out for themselves. Uh, the individual who's in transition has to tell the rest of the employees. So we're even restricted from that perspective outside of just medical information. Okay. It's a, it's a crazy world out you? there. <laughs> you wanted to know that. <laughs> uh, here's it. Fi files on computers. I, there's, a, there's a question. I usually don't do this, but that that's a good job, Van. So can I store it all digitally? And if it's digital, then does it have to be password protected, locked up, encrypted? Like, how do I how do I handle it if I want to do it digitally? I would applaud anyone who wants to go paperless. And that means paperless with drug tests, paperless with background checks. If you can go paperless, go paperless. Mm -hmm. But your instincts are absolutely perfect. Everything has to be so locked and loaded. Because again, you're protecting very sensitive information. Mm -hmm. So just as only one person carries the key, only one person should have the password or access into that particular file. So yes, don't do it haphazard. Make sure that you're working with an IT company that can put all sorts of walls around mm -hmm. that information. So don't store it on my personal laptop that I bring everywhere with me and anyone could steal at any time. Like it, it should probably be on a cloud-based server locked up but even then i can't put the personnel file with the workman's comp yeah. file i have to have two different files on two different accounts or it has to be split but, somehow correct it could be split somehow so i've seen them in different files on the same mm -hmm. in the same group okay but yeah, you, you just, and you don't, you don't just say, okay, let me put you, let me give you access into this particular area because then they'd have access to all the files. Mm -hmm. So again, it's very, it, you've got to stay involved in it. Okay. Sounds good. Um, we got a, we got a couple minutes left. Who else are, do we need to be? You've mentioned so many names. I mean, I thought that the, the world of flooring had an alphabet soup when it came to organizations, but it seems that that's just the way the world works when you get really into any one niche. So what other parts of the alphabet soup are we looking out for? Well, right now the EEOC seems to be really, really involved and it's, it's, it's taken them 10 years to come forward with guidance on the use of bathrooms, but they have stepped in. OSHA just put in three major changes that might affect your industry. Uh, one on heat stress, one on the record keeping and communication of hazardous materials. And then the third one being that they're now permitting outside individuals to walk with inspectors, OSHA inspectors on safety inspections. And that hasn't been allowed, but again, with the movement towards union organization, this uh, opens up the door for a possible union representative to come in with an employee and walk with them with the OSHA inspector to look at facilities mm -hmm. um this is something we're going to have to get used to because it we've, we've been able to control that environment and now we can't interesting okay so lots of things to be i mean i know that this is, this doesn't affect a lot of the small businesses we're talking about but that is that is just a lot to keep track of how do you keep track of it all that this is yeah. like any one of these seems like something that you could just I specialize in in this. It, it, absolutely, absolutely. And that's why I'm the intermediate 
person, right? You've got the attorney on one side and you've got the business on the other side. And so my role is to help the companies understand what to do, what not to do, mm -hmm. and when to do it. And if we get into a problem, then I pull in my my the, in the attorneys that I work with. But it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of reading and it's a lot of education. Um, meeting with attorneys and sitting down and going over a lot. Um, it's it's constant, but I love it. And that's why I just specialize in this little this little section of compliance and regulatory. Mm -hmm. Can't can't step any further than that. Are there any resources that as a small business owner, we should be following to stay up to date on changes or get more informed on what HR actually consists of within our small world? Well, there's organizations called SHRM, the Society of Human Resource Managers. And it's a lot of just HR people giving feedback, but they're also really good about putting out legal announcements uh, so every so often you can get very timely information there. I I would tell you if you have a labor law attorney, definitely copy, you know, get with him and find out if he's sending out any communications because there's Dinsmore Shoal is a big one down here in Cincinnati and they're sending out blasts every so often that mm -hmm. the clients really enjoy. Um, they can always reach out, go to my website. I myself have a, a podcast, which I'd like to promote if I can. Yeah, um, please. And it comes out every week and it's all about the legal changes, the compliance aspects. And there's a library going back to 2017. So if they want to go out and, and just Google my name and uh, most of them are YouTube um, visible. So you can sit there and watch as well, but um, reach out and I'll be more than happy to give you whatever resources you need because it's, it is more than they need to be worried about definitely partner with somebody. I, look, I think that's the smartest way to run a business is hire people to do the things you hate or don't understand. <laughs> that's the best. If you've got extra capital that you've earned, that is the best way to spend it. In my opinion is to hire people to do the things you hate and, and that you don't understand. And you're not an expert at it because there's, again, you, you shouldn't have to become the expert at everything. It's, it's not possible but learn enough no. to get educated enough to hold someone accountable to help protect you. And Pandy has definitely opened my eyes to a lot of things that I didn't know, I, I, you know, I knew enough to come and ask some questions, but there is, there's way more going on than, than I knew. And so I, you know, I didn't even know half the organizations you, you mentioned existed. And that's, that's scary that they can co be coming after you again. I think generally, owners are looking at, okay, it's going to be the IRS, or maybe we know about the labor board or, you know, the local, some local state agency can come after you. But even again, here in Arizona, like the environmental protection agency can come after you for some construction mm -hmm. stuff. Um, right. Exactly right. Is, is there any other major ones that we really need to be concerned about that, are, you know, are just, we wouldn't consider it something to be aware of, but you, you screw up one employee file and, and they're going to be on you? No, I, I I would say, if anything, you need to be very aware of what your state is doing. Okay. Because, again, some of the laws within the states are just going way off board. Um, and, and, and again, if I know it's hard, but if you get someone like me who's watching it on, I have monthly conversations with my clients. I mean, we, we sit down and we talk about either what's coming or what's already occurred mm -hmm. and how it's going to affect them. And the states are probably the the biggest wild card right now with employment law. So I would definitely, definitely be keeping track of that because you can't right. assume that you know, you know what's going on. So well, they're watching us. They're watching us, Kyle. Oh, I'm sure. I no doubt in my mind are they they waiting to pull the trigger on something if if they need to. That would not surprise me one bit. So, well, Pandy, you would be a great resource for Ohio, and I would love to say that if if you need national advice for the federal government, you would be a great resource. But it's I'm assuming it's fair to say that if you are looking to make sure you are in complete compliance you should try and find a fractional HR specialist that works within 
your state. That's a that's a that's a fair statement here, Pandy. Well, I actually work with other states. Okay. So Do you? all right. Well, then, then ignore me <laughs> yeah. and call Pandy. She'll take care of you. She'll look up all your state stuff and and get you figured you out. Know what? <laughs> <laughs> Just don't do a call center. Just don't do a call center. Get somebody me like me who will actually walk the floor with you okay. and actually sit with you and do it face to face. That's the key. Get a real person. Don't do a call center. Okay. Fair enough. Don't go to the don't go to the super big business. We all we all don't like it when we get service from them anyways. You never know yeah. who you're going to get. They're going to have India on the phone talking to you about HR and and that's probably no good. <laughs> Out of a catalog. <laughs> oh my goodness, could be. All right. Um anything else we need to hit on? No, I think this is this is a really good start. The idea is to get your minds thinking and get you questioning about certain things and um and I'm just ecstatic. I, I have to thank Josh again for uh, connecting the two of us. Thank you. Oh, yeah. At, great guy. Uh, great, great business. Totally excited. Always a great conversation with him. And, and this has been wonderful. So uh, what is what is your website? What is the name of the podcast? If they are in Cincinnati, Where? what is the name of the, the, the cable show? Oh, well, yeah. You can go to um, YouTube. ICRC TV and just put in Pandy P A N D Y and you should get all sorts of options there. Okay. Um, the website's the human resource USA.com. Okay. And this, that's got a link to the podcast and everything on it too. It does. Yep. The link. Okay. Yep. I catch it on there. Awesome. That is going to do it for us this week, folks. I hope you learned as much as I did and that it doesn't need to be as scary as it sounds. There are solutions. There there are definitely things where we need to protect ourselves, but this is what it's like to run a company that is that is well-rounded and you know, looking out for the longevity of itself. You have to get involved in the things that we don't know about. It's not about just going and selling the floor, the shower, the, the accent wall, whatever that contracting project is going to be, it's not just about selling it and getting it completed. There are other things you have to be aware of and concerned with, and we've, we've got to be able to step back, get a 30,000 foot view of our business and figure out what is essential. So thank you again, Pandy, for giving us insights into what the human resources components are and why it's not just about sexual harassment complaints all the time when that, you know that's the way tv makes it seem but hr is so much more so thank you folks don't forget to go to floracademypod.com you can check out the shop pick up some swag we've also got if you go to the file section not only can we help you figure out your day rate or what it costs to have an employee on payroll and how much they should be generating you per hour, but you can keep track of your like tools so that your insurance man will hate you if you ever have to file a claim with them. We've also got a uh, job cost analyzer over there so that you can be putting in how much you spent, what the projected revenue was, what the actual revenue was, and really get those margins dialed in and see how profitable you're being per job. Uh, you can help support the show at patreon.com slash floor academy. Even $5 a month would go a long way in helping the content continue come at you. And don't forget about our mastermind groups. If you're looking to grow your business and you want to get serious and have some accountability and talk to other motivated business owners that are trying to do the same thing as you, get signed up. You can go to floor Academy pod slash mastermind, watch a little video, do a little reading. There's a link at the bottom to schedule an appointment with me. We'll talk about it in more detail and get you hooked up. Lastly, we got a quick word from Tice. Stay connected, continue discovering, learn more and network. Now available, you will want to access the International Surface Events new resource library. Flip through the digital pages of the TICE resource books to source products, take tailored journeys through the TICE event offerings, or watch, rewind, and share recorded TICE content from the event. Visit intlsurfaceevent.com. Available now? Nope, I just did that one. Uh, or you can click the link in the show notes. You'll even see this podcast featured inside the TICE 2024 textbook offering select recordings from this year's amazing event in Las Vegas. Don't forget to put the dates for next year in your calendar, book it out, schedule it out, 
block it off. Don't take a project. Make sure you show up in Vegas and get networked and educated on what is going to be coming for 2025. That'll do it for this week, folks. Thank you again, Pandy. We will catch you all next week.